And greetings. Happy Monday. Welcome to the Steve Dace Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio and podcast. Steve Dace here alongside Todd Erzin, Aaron McIntyre, and all of you. Coming up a little bit later on in the program today, Wayne Allen Root is going to join us. He thinks it is time for a boycott. He's written a new book about that. He'll tell us about it here at the bottom of the hour. Next hour, it is time once again to ask me anything, courtesy of our, courtesy of our followers over on Facebook. So we are looking forward to that. Of course, uh, to, this is the beginning of a big week, a week that uh, many of us thought might never get here. I mean, it has been a long, strange, difficult, challenging, rewarding, fun, painful uh, trip to get here. Uh, but it is release week for Nefarious. Nefarious will be released in theaters nationwide this weekend. And if you want to find out screen times near you, which theaters near you, get your tickets now. You can go to NefariousTickets.com. We should know the final list here tonight of uh, theaters around the country that will be opening up the movie. NefariousTickets.com is where you want to go. That's NefariousTickets.com. And I have gotten a lot of questions over the last couple of months about our marketing. Why did you guys make a movie with this tone? Why did you market it like this? And there's a, uh, there's a scene in Jesus Revolution when uh, Lonnie Frisbee says to Chuck Smith, he says, you know, if you want to reach this generation, you have to go where they are. And, you know, they're involved in the counterculture. They're involved in the subcultures. You've got to, you've got to speak to them in a way that they would understand. Last year, Hollywood studios released 31 horror films in one year. I mean, it's the most profitable genre of film right now. This is where Gen Z is. And I want to share this note that I received. My son was baptized around 10. He was devout in his beliefs all through junior and senior high. He was the preacher each year for Youth Sunday and went on mission trips to Mexico, India, Nepal, and other foreign countries up through his sophomore year in college. But then he became fully woke at uh, University of North Carolina and informed me he no longer believed in God. Flash forward to the other night. I asked him if he would do me a favor and watch something on YouTube. And when he finished, he, and, and when he finished, give me his opinion on it. He agreed. So I played for him your nefarious trailer. You will be pleased at what he said about it. He said, at first I thought it was a Christian movie, but it's obviously a horror movie. I smiled and said, you and the others involved in this film wanted just that response from the public. I will never stop praying for my son to return to the Lord. And I pray nefarious and other movies like it will be one tool that God uses to soften his and others hearts. May God bless the production of this movie, Mary Ravella. That's why. That's why right there. That's why we did this. Those of you that are a little bit older, you're like, oh, I don't know if I can do kind of this kind of a movie, this genre of a movie. You know, that scene in Jesus Revolution when the crop duster plane flies over top and drops uh, the acid from the sky at the Timothy Leary, Timothy Leary, Janis Joplin concert, and you watch Greg Laurie and his future wife just sit there and drop acid in the movie. Um, you know, when you guys did that, your parents thought it was the end of days. You guys are taking drugs out in broad daylight, taking your clothes off in broad daylight. If you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with in broad daylight, sleeping with anybody that moves. Your parents thought that was the end of days. They went out and bought every book Hal Lindsey ever wrote for like the next decade after they saw your counterculture. It's just, it seems kind of light and trite to you because it's the sinfulness of your generation. So you are desensitized to it. But, but your parents and grandparents, they thought they were living in the last days after they witnessed it. This is the sinfulness of this era. And if we don't confront it right now, and if we don't have revival here in like the next 15 minutes, I don't even want to contemplate what the next generation will accept and get desensitized to might not even be a next generation on the pace we are on right now. Those are the stakes we are playing for right now. And so that's why we made this movie the way that we made it. That's why we marketed it the way that we marketed it. Because like Lonnie Frisbee says in Jesus Revolution, if you want to reach this next generation, you have to speak to them in a language they understand. They, they've rejected your sweater vested pastor. They don't care. Your khaki, pa- pla- your khaki, your khaki panted plaster pastor. They've moved on. 
you're nicer than God, uh, pastor, you know, uh, getting ready to go in through his Hawaiian shirt collection with summer looming. They don't care. They're going to 31 horror movies last year. They're into the darkness. I saw this for the first time years ago. I remember when Todd used, we used to go to horror or you go to haunted houses at Halloween, take mm-hmm. the, take girls because basically that was a great way for them to cuddle up and get close. Right. Everybody knew it was just a thrill seek. Everybody knew it was an emotional response. Nobody took it seriously. Nobody thought it was a subculture, right? right. You went out, had, you, you went out, got in line, waited, went through a 15 minute maze, screamed a few times and then went to pizza afterwards sure. and everybody forgot about the experience. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You go to a haunted house nowadays. That's not what you say. It's a culture. I mean, they're in, the kids are into it. It's a subculture. They're into it. It is not a thrill seek. It is not a phase. It's a worldview. This is where they are. And so that's where we needed to go. And thank you, Mary, for your note. And pray that your son is greatly impacted by the movie we made for him. We made it for him and, and people like him because they are not uncommon in this era. And so pray that our movie is able to reach sons and daughters like yours. And again, you can get your tickets now for this weekend, nefariousTickets.com. And with that, here's Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by Judge Not Lest Ye Be Judged. The Dalai Lama is apologizing after having kissed a young boy in public and proceeding to ask said young boy to suck on his tongue. And suck my tongue. <laughs> Moving on, the Pentagon is remaining mum regarding whether or not alleged classified documents which popped up on social media are legit. The documents provide what appears to be details on the progress of weapons and equipment going into Ukraine with more precise timelines and amounts than what the U.S. generally provides publicly. Maybe there's a spy at the Department of Defense. Also at the Pentagon, the long-awaited report regarding the U.S.'s pullout of Afghanistan dropped on Friday. And surprise, everything went perfectly and Joe Biden is an angel. Here's Pentagon spokesman John Kirby. Get planes coming in and getting them loaded. Have medical screening. Have security vetting. Have diplomatic presence on the ground to make sure that we're putting the right people on planes. Uh, But also defend that airport from external threats. Um, that's pretty remarkable. And so for all this talk of chaos, I just didn't see it. Not from my perch. You may remember the name Rebecca Jones. She's the data analyst in Florida who was fired from the Florida Department of Health during COVID for skewing official statistics from the Department of Health to make them look worse than they actually were. Since then, she's fancied herself as a martyr and whistleblower and has faced a few legal issues of her own. Now she's put herself back in the headlines after her teenage son was busted by police for threatening to shoot up a school. A warrant was issued for her son's arrest, and so Rebecca Jones subsequently claimed Ron DeSantis kidnapped her son. The problem is there's video footage of Jones herself turning in her own son to a county sheriff. Speaking of Ron DeSantis, he was in Michigan last week speaking at Hillsdale College. When we talk about the free state of Florida, yes, I mean freedom in a sense of absence of government getting involved in your business. I think that's typically when you believe in constitutionally limited government. You keep government in its corner, keep it cabined, uh, and I think traditionally we assume the rest of society would function uh, better. Well, I think modern times we've seen the left get into so many different arteries of our society. So yes, you have to limit government's involvement with you, but you also have to contest the left and all these other institutions. So when I say the free state of Florida, uh, I mean not only uh, limited government, but I also mean I have a responsibility to protect my citizens from having the pathologies of the left imposed upon them by all these other institutions in our society. So yes, we win legislative battles. The state of Florida uh, has no income tax. You guys in Michigan should try that sometime. It works out pretty good. (laughs) We have our budget in Florida, even though we have millions of more people than the state of New York, our budget is half the size of the budget of the state of New York. Yet we have better services, education, and infrastructure. Where is their money going? Uh, So we have one of the smallest per capita tax and debt and government employee ratios anywhere in the country. That's traditional limited government 
Good for business, good for economic growth, absolutely. But that in this day and age is not enough. And there are some Republicans that think their job is to cut taxes and not do anything else. That is not how we conceive of our job. We in Florida drove the stake in the heart of COVID authoritarianism in this country. We saved the country from Fauciism. California Governor Gavin Newsom is getting sick of California himself, so he's on a media tour obsessing about the Florida governor. Here he is on MSNBC. He's going to get rolled by Trump. Trump's just going to roll him. Thumped. I honestly, if I were offering him political advice, I'd, I'd tell him to pack up and, and wait a few years and actually do some of the hard work, which actually includes governing, not just identity and culture war. Um, actually go back and actually start to address some of the insurance issues, start to address some of the cost uh, issues, and particularly cost of housing. These are very familiar. I'm very humbled by all of this. The Seventh U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled late last week that an Indiana school district did not violate a former music teacher's rights by pushing him to resign after the man refused to use students' preferred names and pronouns. John Kluge was hired in 2014 as the music and orchestra teacher for Brownsburg High School. In 2017, district officials began requiring the high school's teachers to use the names and pronouns listed in the school's official student database. Kluge refused, so he was pushed to resign by the school district and filed a lawsuit afterwards. And now a story being completely ignored by the mainstream media. The country of Switzerland is no longer recommending the COVID jabs for anyone. The country's official website for public health said in a statement, quote, in principle, no COVID-19 vaccination is recommended for spring and summer of 2023. Nearly everyone in Switzerland has been vaccinated and or contracted and recovered from COVID-19. Their immune system has therefore been exposed to the coronavirus. In spring and summer of 2023, the virus will likely circulate less. The current virus variants also cause rather mild illness. For autumn of 2023, the vaccination recommendation will be evaluated again and adjusted accordingly, end quote. A new Pew survey finds the number of people in the U.S. who say they know somebody who identifies as an atheist is growing. Back in 2019, 65% of Americans said they knew an atheist. Now, that number is 71%. Fewer people say they know Catholics and Jews as they did in 2019, while those who say they know an evangelical Christian or mainline Protestant has remained relatively stable. And finally, this from comedian Tyler Fisher. Hey guys, it's Taylor. It's day six of girlhood and look who I got, a new sponsor. Look at this cool Bud Light tower they sent me. Bud Light sent me so much cool stuff because they're so inclusive. Look at this Bud Light tank top. And I've obviously been drinking a lot of Bud. I also might be pregnant, don't tell anyone. They also sent me this, check this out. Ready? They sent me a Bud plug, look at this. And that's what happened while we were away. Not, not even parody, man. Not even humor. That's like next year's Super Bowl commercial. Documentary. Yes. Aaron's Montage brought to you by our friends over at Jace Medical. I was reading this morning from our buddy Peter McCullough. Pretty exhaustive study about the effectiveness of hydroxychloroquine and AZ in the early stages of infection from COVID-19. And of course, they took those two drugs and wouldn't let you have any of them because they were just fine killing you. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, that's, that's why they, they were fine killing you because you living with these cheap drugs would have gotten in the way of the trillions of dollars that they were going to make via Operation Warp Speed to put out these experiments instead and experiment on you with them. So who knows, the next time they may do that, make sure you're prepared with our friends over at Jace Medical. Get the Jace case of venerable antibiotics so that you know, hey, those are in the cabinet, the cupboard, we're safe. If something were to go down and they were to say yet again, hey, this time it's amoxicillin. Hey, this time it's doxycycline. You never know. So because you never know these days, make sure you know you're prepared. Go to jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E for jacemedical.com. Use the discount code DACE uh, at checkout for a discount. That's why it's called a discount code. Dace at checkout at Jace Medical, J-A-S-E, jacemedical.com. All right, coming up in the overtime today, Aaron is going to completely surprise me. I don't know what's coming, and he's going to hit me cold. And I usually get to do that to you guys. So I am anxious to see how you guys do this to me for a change. If you're a subscriber, you will get to see that later today at blazetv.com slash dace. If you're not yet a subscriber to Blaze TV, today's a good day to find out what it looks like when I am surprised by something. That's where you want to go. Uh, blazetv.com slash dace is also where you can go to sign up to become a subscriber to Blaze TV today for just $10 a month. 
blazetv.com slash dace. We will record it shortly after today's program and then upload it for you at blazetv.com slash dace. The, the Budweiser story, can we, t- can we talk about that with Bud Light for a second? Sure. Because I was having a conversation over the weekend with somebody and the, the conversation was, why are these companies doing things that will lose them money? And I listened to what this person, smart person, I was having this conversation with. Absolutely a smart person. Okay. But they still believe that there's this neutral mechanism in our culture called the marketplace where eventually these things get sifted and filtered, right? And the people decide if they want this or they want that or they don't want that and they do want this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I had to explain to this person who again is is very intelligent. I I just, I, I don't think that's true anymore. I don't. And You look at that Pew survey data that, Aaron, you had at the end of your montage, and then you compare it to the Wall Street Journal data that we had about a week or so ago here on the show. And to put it bluntly, that's, that's, that's America in the corner losing its religion. Well, losing its original religion. There, there will be another religion. I mean, the, the idea that it will just be a religionless society, oh no, it will not. There will be another religion. Another religion will emerge to take the place of the one that vacated said space. Nature abhors a vacuum. Something will emerge to take that place. And so you saw in that chart from Pew, more people know a Muslim than they ever have in America before. More people know an atheist, which is another way of saying uh, someone who worships at the altar of themselves or the state than they ever have before. Something else will take its place. And and man, if, if I'm not successful at doing anything on this show, I, I have no idea. We'll find out this weekend if I'm any good at selling a movie. We'll find out, okay? I've had mixed success selling books. I've had a couple of bestsellers. I've had four that weren't, you know? So, I don't know. I've had mixed success with candidates. I've won a few, lost a few, all right? So... You know, I may not just be, a, I might just not be that good of a salesman. But one thing that I am going to go to the mattresses in the nth degree to sell you on, if there is one thing I need to disabuse you of on this show, it is the silent majority paradigm. And I am going to break it. Because it's just one of the biggest lies that we tell ourselves. It's just not true. And questions like, What are companies like ESPN and Disney, which are the same company now, but Bud Light and others. Jack Daniels, I think, also hired Dylan Mulvaney last week. Didn't they hire him last week? I believe believe so. Yeah. What, what, 10 years ago, when they tried to cancel the Robertsons after Phil Robertson had given an interview, I want to say it was to GQ, was it? That, uh, I remember the interview. I don't remember basically just with. reciting the birds and the bees. Mm-hmm. That it's natural for men to be attracted to women and yeah. for women to be attracted to men. And that's how we perpetuate the species. And they, they tried to cancel him. If I recall, Cracker Barrel was one of the big uh, sponsors of Duck Dynasty at the time, which was the number one show in America for a while. And uh, they tried to cancel him. And there was such, a, such blowback against Cracker Barrel that they were back in just a matter of days. That was 10 years ago. I know, because I wrote a column about it for USA Today at the time. It was their second most read column of the year 2013. Here's what's changed in the last 10 years. 10 years ago, USA Today would come to me and offer me a gig writing for them. Try to set me up as a foil up against their left-wing editorial board and everything else, but at least I'd get a voice, right? Mm-hmm. Would they do that today? No. No, oh, no. Oh, no. Could you, I, could you imagine the reaction of the, of the rest of the USA Today print staff byline by Steve Dace in the op-ed page? You know what the reaction is. It's the same reaction the New York Times got a couple of years ago. It was the Washington Post. I put Tom Cotton in there. Or Ben Shapiro was another one of those. 
One was one was Cotton, one was Shapiro, but they're they're both basically the same entity, the Post and the Times. So same reaction. I mean, how dare we? I mean, how dare you guys publish articles by these racists? So there's not even bias any longer. You're not even permitted a presence. Like it, it used to be for decades, we'd at least get in there. The New York Times would have one William Sapphire for all the rest of the staff, right? <clears throat> no, 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 no. You're not even you're not even invited any longer. Because there is no neutral marketplace any longer. There isn't. Everything has been weaponized. So Bud White may very well see tremendous losses for this. So they're not a corporation in the traditional sense. They're a house of worship. And they don't abandon their gods the way we abandon ours. They are, I wonder, you think the, the front office at Bud Light is completely unaware of the blowback against them from conservative America, traditional America, religious America. The Karen <clears throat> VP who is apparently responsible for this is well aware of it because she did a little YouTube video to correct speak to the masses. They're proud of it. Now, we don't understand this because we have not been properly discipled or catechized by a Judeo-Christian worldview and the houses of worship, whether the few remaining conservative synagogues there are left in America, um, Christian churches that actually take the catechesis and discipleship seriously. Jesus did not say go out and convert the nations. He said to disciple the nations. Those are two totally different things. Go out and make people feel bad about their sins once and say a prayer and then just kind of, you know, let them figure it out from there. That is that's not what he said? No? No. No, it's not what he said. Discipleship is a lifelong process. He who has begun a good work in you is faithful until the day of its completion. When is it completed? When you're dead. That's when it's completed. Not a minute long, not a minute sooner. If you are in communion with Christ, your mission is completed the day you die and not a moment sooner. That's when it's completed. That's when they finish their work in you. And next thing you hear is, well done, good and faithful servant. Don't get preached to like that very often though in America, no, do we? No, no, we don't. So we don't recognize what's going on over there. Let me explain it to you. Many times in the movie Nefarious, he will take the scriptures and quote them accurately. Accurately. And in context, even. It's the application where things will break down. Nefarious will apply it to him and his, and, and, and his acolytes. To the spirit of the age. That's what's going on here. Bud Light considers it joy to suffer for the name. That's what the disciples felt when they were scourged, beaten, lashed for preaching Christ. They went back to the rest of their disciples, Peter and John, and they counted it all joy to suffer for the name. It was an honor to suffer for the name. We don't want to suffer for like anything. We don't want to risk anything. We just want to watch Fox, vote GOP, save America never. That's still our plan by and large. So we don't recognize true conviction. Bud Light is not blindsided by your disdain. It was counting on it. It is provoking you on purpose. It was hoping to get this reaction. That's how it knows it's on the right course. We, see, we used to behave like this for decades in Western countries like this one, particularly in this one. Make all the right enemies. Must mean you're over the target. These are things we used to say to each other in our churches. Now the minute any form of suffering comes up, we pray that someone, can you guys pray for me that God would take this away? We have not been taught perseverance. We've not been taught what Michael Keaton's Alfred says to Bruce Wayne in the dark night. Endure. Someone has to. 
What would you have me do? He says, Alfred, what would you have me do? If it looks like there's too much darkness, we cannot win. Endure, go to the end, go all the way to the end, finish the race. We're not taught that in our churches. They're taught that in theirs. And then they are also taught that if you suffer, if these right wingers ding you, we'll just give you a bailout. You're too big to fail. They have built a fellowship. May I say a church? They have each other's backs. They go to the end. This is where the real religious commitment and conviction exists in America. America is not devoid of real religious commitment and conviction. It is replete with the wrong religious commitment and conviction. Gentlemen, your thoughts. What uh, this all is ultimately up to the Holy Spirit, but would all for the next month following Easter, Holy Spirit overcome the preachers of this entire land and start preaching the full counsel of God? Do you think a month from now, the churches would be larger or smaller in terms of a population? Again, I, I don't know, but I think the people there would be larger in terms of impact, regardless of what the numbers were. Oh, the, absolutely. But just from your point about the reality of, of whether what people have been getting for so long, I, I think the, I think the churches would empty out in the near term. Pope Benedict preached about this thing and that may very well be necessary. Oh, you mean like a sifting that the people yes, that came to be yes. patted on the belly, they, they, they bolt. And then I, you know what I've, I've, this happened at the church that I spoke to in, uh, in, um, uh, where was it at in Tennessee last year? I forget, but the Calvary, Chattanooga, uh, Chattanooga Calvary chapel. I mean, they, they saw massive turnover. Okay, and now their attendance is bigger than it was before. But over the course of a couple of years, all kinds of people that were used to the soft-headed preaching, yeah. you bet they ejected. And now they ended up getting replaced by new people. Now some people drive like an hour out of town to come to this church on a Sunday. But yeah, they went through that kind of a transition process for sure. And I think that's that's true because the the beer lady here who's doing this, she understands that you may not want to be a high priest of this whole thing like me. But I, I know, I mean, she knows you. She knows your heart. She knows you're swimming around in this. She knows how easily you can be manipulated. She knows where your sense of authority lies. Because there's all kinds of people in modern day churches who you, we would somehow describe, just like you described your friend. And I don't know who your friend is or what, but they, they're, they're not dumb. No. But they're still sheep. And they just follow. What if just 25%, 10% of our churches treated the sin of their own congregants the same way lefties are treating and continue to treat Anna Kasparian right now, the Young Turks, for just saying, stop calling me a birthing unit. Mm -hmm. I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. They are discipling her. They are disciplining her mm -hmm. for going outside. That's, that's, that's the inverse. That's the upside down version of discipleship in our own churches, if it actually happens. What if we were zealous? What if we were zealous in that way, to the same degree that they are, with their own adherence about towing the correct line, whether that's pronouns or, or just, um, you know, um, it's a birthing unit after all, uh, the, uh, along those lines. What if we were that zealous with, you know, sin in our own churches? Things would change very quickly, I would, I would say. But to your overall point, and a point that's been brought up several times the last few weeks, all, seemingly all, of that fortitude is on the other side right mm -hmm. now. And nothing, the trajectory of this country will not change until that changes. I promise you that's true.
Now is a great time to start taking better care of your liver more than ever. Latest data indicates adults with fatty liver three and a half more times more likely to have heart failure than those without. 100 million Americans may be dealing with that, in fact, which means many people are at risk, and it's because we throw everything at our livers. Cholesterol, st- alcohol, toxins, Tylenol, statins. Still about 20% of the population smoke cigarettes. That's why so many of us have sluggish, fatty livers that make us gain weight, lose energy, etc. For decades, uh, now your liver has helped you with over 500 key functions every day. Now it's time for you to return the favor and help your liver with our friends over at GetLiverHelp.com. GetLiverHelp.com slash Steve. You can try their liver health formula uh, that is made right here in the U.S., approved by American doctors. Uh, when you go, And get a free gift of their nano-powered omega-3s as well to help keep you heart healthy. When you go to GetLiverHealth.com slash Steve, get started with their liver health formula and the free gift at GetLiverHelp.com slash Steve. Name of the book. The Great Patriot Bycott Book. The Great Conservative Companies to Buy From and Invest In. The author, Wayne Allen Root, joins us here on the show. Good to see you, my friend. How are you? Hey, Steve. How are you? Great to be on with you. Doing very well. Always good to talk to you. It's been too long. And, you know, the timing of of this conversation, by the way, with what we were just discussing with Bud Light and Dylan Mulvaney has essentially become a high priest (laughs) of the spirit of the age. Corporations are lining up to to genuflect to him to say, yes, we recognize that you have anointed him as one of your secular gods and, and therefore we will genuflect accordingly. I think that we on the right have to get into the notion Wayne, that the old neutral marketplace where we could go and hash these things out and then in the end, if they lost money, they'd turn away. I don't know that that exists anymore. I think we're, these companies, they're true believers in many cases now. This isn't just the every June during the rainbow month, you know, uh, let's go ahead and, and pander to a group of people. I think this is real conviction, but what are your thoughts? Well, some of them are true believers, Steve, and I think some of them are suicidal uh, in that they're listening to the liberal woke media, which tells them that if you support LGBTQ and transgender ideology and transgender brainwashing and you wave the rainbow flag, you'll get more business from transgenders and gay people. And that's all well and good. Uh, My grandfather came to America with nothing, Steve, Mm -hmm. zero from Germany. And he said, Wayne, there's two keys to success in life why I've achieved success. Number one, the customer is always right. And number two, if the customer is wrong, refer back to number one, (laughs) because the customer is always right. Our customer for any company is, and I'm not saying gay people are bad or transgenders are bad, but the majority of your customers are normal, uh, as in uh, straight, uh, Republican, conservative, go to church on Sunday. Uh, if you're Budweiser beer, it's macho men who tend to vote Republican and tend to be Trump supporters. So why would you throw the 99% away for the 1%? The transgenders are less than 1%. Gay might be 4%. Don't you care about the 96% or the 99%? This is mass Suicide. You got to worry about the majority of your customers or the silent majority that tends to be conservative, church going, patriotic, believes in God, Christian, etc., uh, has faith in religion and God. That's still the majority. It may be a slim majority, but it's a majority, but it's a huge majority of those who buy certain products. And Budweiser is one of them. So it makes no sense. So I wrote a book. The new one you showed is the Great Patriot Bycut book, but I just want to mention two. Two years ago, I wrote a number one bestseller called The Great Patriot Boycott Book. And that book was about the 116 companies that I deemed woke and liberal, and you should start boycotting them and stop spending your money with them because they're using your money to destroy America. My buddy on Wall Street just did an analysis of what I achieved in my book. Since I wrote it two years ago and it came out a year and a half ago, those 116 companies have lost over $1 trillion in market cap. They're killing themselves. They're committing suicide. I must add a crystal ball, Steve. I came up with Disney, Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, Victoria's Secret, you name the company, the woke company, I had them in my book, and they're all getting crushed. So my new book, The Great Patriot Bicot Book, 
is simply the flip side, the positive side of that same strategy. Here's where you could spend your money, and here are the 123 best companies in America that are conservative, non-woke, and you could proudly spend your money and know you're giving it to a good company that will support Republican conservative causes. Give us a sample of uh, some of those companies, because we have really struggled to build a parallel economy, Wayne, because much of the corporate sector is aligned against us. So for every Patriot Mobile out there, there's seven other cell phone carriers that are literally, uh, you know, communist agents. So who are give us some ideas of places that maybe we hadn't thought of before we could go and spend our money. Well, Marriott is in there, very conservative company. Omni Hotels is in there. Great Patriot Mobile is in there. So those are all good examples. Uh, Chick-fil-A is in there. And by the way, some of them still do a few questionable liberal woke things. Chick-fil-A has had some question marks lately. But in general, in general, they do a very good job and they have a good history. Um, who else is in there? I don't know. There's so many great ones. in and out Burger is in there. Hobby Lobby is in there. It's 123 companies and 120 Two of them are fantastic, and I stand behind them. One of them I'm about to throw out of the book. I'm actually redoing the book and putting out a new copy in two months, and I'm throwing them out. Guess who that is? Do you want to make a guess? Um, You know what? I'm afraid if I guess wrong, and then I look right. bad, so I won't. Budweiser. <laughs> They were Uh, conservative, and I put them in the book, and they committed suicide overnight. And that's a good example. You know what Reagan used to say? You know, our our great country, America, American exceptionalism, capitalism, democracy, our republic, it's always one generation away from losing it Mm -hmm. all. And that's what I say about these companies. Budweiser made my book as one of the great conservative companies you could spend your money with. And in one day, they committed suicide because they let some woke marketing company put a transgender as their spokesman and they killed their whole company with one dumb miscalculation. Now I'm throwing them out of the book and I'm replacing them with a, with a very conservative company that should have been on the list from the beginning, but I ran out of room. Now I'm putting them in to replace Budweiser. That's the point of my whole book. You've got to reward the good guys and punish the bad guys or they'll never learn. So even if Budweiser tries to say we didn't mean it, it was a mistake, I'm throwing them out and we're going to put them on probation. They no longer deserve Deserve to be in my book, and I'm going to replace them with a good conservative company. What's the hardest thing about building a parallel economy? Well, I, I don't know that it's hard at all, unless you know you have. A, there's some companies you can't replace. You know, you can do the best you can. I'm, I'm always, I'm not a radical, Steve. I'm kind of a moderate radical. And what I mean is I want to build a, a conservative parallel economy, a conservative ecosystem, and, and I want two parallel countries almost. I want us to start building a new country for conservatives, red states versus blue states. But I'm also a compromiser. So let's just say Amazon as an example. Amazon's a very woke liberal company run by Jeff Bezos, who's a woke liberal guy. I'd love to tell you never buy anything from Amazon ever again. But guess where my book is number one in 20 categories? Amazon. Because 83% of all books sold in America every day are purchased via Amazon. Yes. And every conservative book is at Amazon. I've written 16 books. All 16 are for sale at Amazon. Almost every one of them becomes a number one bestseller at Amazon. They've never censored me. They've never banned me. So I say, here's the compromise with an Amazon. Don't buy anything else anymore from Amazon if you could find a good conservative alternative. And I've got several in my book. The Great Patriot Bicot book has alternatives to Amazon. But having said that, let me turn my alarm off. Having said that, buy conservative books from Amazon. So that way, if their sales are down by a thousand percent this year, but conservative books are up by a thousand percent, they'll get the message. That's the way I do things, Steve. There are ways to compromise, but I did find a great company. Company here, GreatPatriotStore.com was a company I found that sells 500 products everyone uses in and around their home and on their body. That the company is, every product is made by the company, made in the USA, the highest quality, and and you could beat inflation because every product, there's no middleman, so every product is 20 to 50 percent less than what you pay for at say Costco or Sam's Club or Walmart or any store or even any online site.
website. So go there and buy from them instead of buying the same product at Amazon that might fund the Democrat Party and woke causes. GreatPatriotStore.com. There's a great example you've probably never heard of. I've never heard of them. No. GreatPatriotStore.com. I appreciate it. I'm going to make a mental note of that. GreatPatriotStore.com. Before I let you go, where would which one of your books would Pfizer and Moderna land in? <laughs> Pfizer, you know, here's the interesting thing. When I wrote this book, I didn't want to get banned by Amazon or anyone else. So I kind of hid my real beliefs inside the book. It sounds like it's just a boycott book, great patriotic companies. But um, about half the book are my opinions of what's happening in America. And then the other half, uh, the other half of the book, the back half, are all the companies with a full page on each company, the products they sell, and why I rated them as conservative. But the first half of the book, Steve, is what I believe is happening to America, a communist takeover of the United States, not socialist, not progressive, communist takeover. And I tell you why. Uh, rigged elections. And I tell you why. I absolutely believe in every cell of my body. And I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm no dummy. And I don't wear antennas on my head. I'm telling you, elections are being stolen. Not just the 2020 election. Carrie Lake was just stolen. I think that uh, Adam Laxalt in Nevada for U.S. Senate was just stolen. There's a lot of stolen elections. Our country is rigged. And then I've got an entire third of the book about the COVID vaccine and how dangerous dangerous and deadly it is, and the lies and propaganda that have been told to fool you. This book is about the COVID vaccine being dangerous and deadly, but you don't know it till you open the book. I sneak it in. So I think I did it in a way that, you know, nobody will say, ooh, let's censor the book because it doesn't look like it's about the COVID vaccine, but it is. The Great Patriot Boycott Book, The Great Conservative Companies to Buy From and Invest In. He mentioned it's available at Amazon right now in bookstores everywhere uh, from Wayne Allen Root. Good to see you, brother. Uh, good luck with Thanks, the book. Steve. I don't think you're going to need it, though. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. God bless. God Same bless. And Root for America. It's my website, rootforamerica.com. Thank you. Bye-bye. You good got morning. it, man. God bless. Thank you. The GreatPatriotStore.com. Remember that. I, I, have you guys heard of that one? No, I, I, not, I had not heard of that one before. This is a great time, by the way, great segue to tell you about our friends over at Constitution Wealth because they're trying to help you do exactly what Wayne is talking about. That is, that is to now align your values with your virtues. Together, they will work with you to create a financial plan that is based on your principles. Uh, because when you align your money with your values, that's when you achieve true profit. Go to investwithcw.com slash Steve. CW for Constitution Wealth. Investwithcw.com slash Steve. I like the idea. That's why we had him on. I like the idea of here's where you can go and shop instead. And I also like the approach of admitting there's just certain uh, industries and things we just, in our, in our current society, just can't completely and totally replace. There are realities to this situation. I think fundamentally at all this, it dovetails <clears throat> with what we said about leaving church. Listen, it, if you just read the gospels, you know, Jesus isn't nice. Um, but our, uh, we are so drunk on that notion. Well, that's why if you suddenly got the truth, people would leave. Mm -hmm. I think it's much harder and it shows where our heart truly lies it, it, people would stay a lot longer with a brand, even when they do this, uh, because they're comfortable with that brand. And at the end of the day, I, I think whether we're talking about uh, what we were talking about earlier with church or this, ultimately, the idol we really have to talk about po what we're polishing on a regular basis is comfort. And Dylan Mulvaney, I don't even uh, we see it as grotesque. Uh, I think most people see it as stupid, laughable. I don't think they think it's mocking them, though. And until that happens, uh, yeah, the, the companies are always going to be on kind of fringe level, sustainable, plucky, but parallel? Uh, we don't have the hearts and minds to be parallel right now because we, we, we just are not offended by the things we should be offended at, not be even close. I mean, I, I counted over the weekend th three big name conservative websites that I respect and share their information frequently that wanted you to know that uh, Bruce Jenner is, is very offended at what is going on to erase women's sports. I mean, that is the equivalent of going to a Medellin Mexican drug cartel 
and and publishing um, an interview with them uh, where they think the overdose rate of opio- on opio- opioids is just way too high. He's the trailblazer for this. He, he normalized it. He made it mainstream. He's America's first truly yeah. uh, d- d- transsexual celebrity. Before that, whether they were called RuPaul or what have you, they were known as transvestites or drag queens. He normalized this in society. And yet, I mean, even some conservative sites were putting stories out with, you know, using him, who's a model for this psychosis, as a, as, as, well, if, and I know why we do that. Well, yeah, man, if even, if even Bruce Jenner says we've gone too far, no, 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 no. Bruce Jenner has gone too far and needs to be rebuked, um, not quoted from. Nevermore, quoth the Raven. Aaron? I have a couple of questions. Uh, can we build a parallel economy uh, while remaining anonymous and staying in our homes? Probably not. Um, you probably can't build a parallel economy while just wanting to be left alone. Yeah. I'm okay. thinking that those two things probably don't mix. Okay. So we need to keep that in mind, probably. That's yeah. probably a, an important part of this because for the longest time, pick any issue, even more important than the economy, although it comes back to to everything the economy does any issue that's been our approach i am i am as courageous as the day is long i am as courageous as the day is long and i am as fierce as the night is dark so long as i can remain my in my home anonymously and be left alone and uh watch sean hannity and uh vote gop to save america that's been our side for the last, for my entire life, even going back probably before I was even born. So that's not, I, you know, I appreciate, um, and I'm not knocking this at all, I, I greatly appreciate attempts to build a parallel economy because they're, those attempts actually are happening in spite of their target customers. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate that and it, it needs to continue to happen. I mean, um, a friend, uh, Matthew Peterson, has been on this for right. years now Right. Uh, over at the Claremont. I don't know if he's still with the Claremont Institute, yeah. but um, he's been on this for years. It's just a matter of um, do we have the appetite, a la what Todd was just saying, do we have the appetite to actually make the changes where we absolutely can to build that here on the consumer end? And some some places, like our friends at Patriot Mobile, been very successful in doing that. Can we Can we scale that? to size i am skeptical but hopeful at the same time all right we'll come back hour two it is your chance to ask me anything your questions are next stay tuned back here with hour two live and on demand on blaze tv radio and podcast steve dace here with totters and aaron mcintyre and all of you let us know what you think about what we think via the stevedace.com inbox, which you can take advantage of by emailing the show. Steve at stevedace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, me, we, and Gab. Follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Getter, Instagram, and TikTok. And then find me on Truth Social at Real Steve Dace there, at Real Steve Dace. Don't forget, last name is spelled D-E-A-C-E. All of you that listen to the podcast, thank you. If you've yet to do this, please leave us a five-star review. Hit subscribe or follow. Thank Thank you to each and every one of you that have done those things for us already. We appreciate each and every one. Ask Me Anything is brought to you by Birch Gold. Inflation has its consequences as the Fed raises interest rates to combat out of control. Government spending long-term bonds have diminished in value, which has crippled banks. Depositors now holding their breath. Investors bailing on bank stocks. Diversification, therefore, folks, has never been more important than it is right now. The recent surge in gold prices directly tied to this extreme market volatility. And that's why gold has historically been great as a hedge against these kinds of government debasement schemes for time in memorial. Here's what you need to do. Text Steve to 989-898. That's text Steve to 989-898 to get a free info kit on gold. They'll help you convert your existing IRA or 401k that's tied to a volatile market into an IRA in precious physical metals like gold and silver. And the best part, It's tax sheltered. Text Steve to 989-898 to get your free gold info kit today. Again, text Steve to 989-898. 
All right, by now you guys know the drill. I solicit said questions, see none of them. Todd, you curate the questions and decide which ones we're going to line up to answer here on the show. Good week. Uh, and so it was done. It was an excellent week, I thought. Great. Yeah. Great. So thank you to our Facebook followers for making it an excellent week of questions. Aaron has the questions you have selected, and let us begin. We will begin with Sherry's Snazzy Sweets, who says, <laughs> question for all three of you as a parent, how do you deal with the fear inside for your children? I try to be strong, but there's an inner fear for my children growing up in this godless world. So I, I think for us... If not, you know, I'll let you guys answer for yourselves if you want. But I, I think for us, getting to do this for a living gives us a feeling, at least this is true of me, it gives us a feeling that I'm doing what I can. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I'm not a passive observer in this process. I am, you know, I'm, I'm neck deep in it right now. We're in the mess right now. We're in the soup, okay? And um, this is, this platform gives me the ability to do everything I can and maybe it's not much in the end. Who knows? But it's everything that I can do to know that if it goes down and that's what we end up handing off to our children, then I did everything I possibly could. And you know what? God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. If, if, if this is the end of this once great republic, is it unjustified? Is, is, is God unfair if he pronounces judgment on this country. No. No. A final judgment on this country even. Would he be unfair to do so? No. Many days I ask him, what are you waiting for? <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> um, this time of year, we typically say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Todd says, come quickly, sulfur. Yes. But um, yeah, it's not unjustified. And remember... God has told his people in captivity before or under judgment before. Accept the judgment. Accept the punishment. You earned it. The wages of sin. What's a wage? Something you earn. You earned this. You earned it. On the other hand, don't be an ingrate. Continue to marry. Continue to have children. You know, because even while I am allowing you to be judged or punished, I am still sovereign in this process and do still plan on preserving a people unto myself through it all. So I think this is where the, the paradoxical nature of Christianity comes into play. On one hand, we are going to do everything we can in the hopes that we can provoke the heart of God to mercy and to revival. At the same time, we recognize God would not be unjust if his heart was moved toward judgment at all. And at the same time, even if it's not an outcome that we would like or will be the most fun outcome, we still will bless his name because he has still given us far more than we deserve, even if all he had given us was Jesus and nothing more. Food, shelter, even if he'd given us nothing other than Christ, it would still be far more than we ever deserve. And so if you're gonna, if you're gonna navigate the Christian life Two things you need to have, a humble heart. And a lot of people think um, that means something in a worldly context, like um, having like no confidence in what you believe in, having no conviction, um, just being a squish and flexible and, and walked over. That's not what humility means in the scriptures. Humility means a recognition, to quote the great prophet Stephen Curtis Chapman, one of his songs, God is God and I am not. That's what humility means in the scriptures. It, it's not, again, a sentiment. It's not a tone. It's, it's, not, it's not any of that. It, it's a recognition of the reality that God is God and we are not. Okay? That's, that's where humility is, is measured in the scriptures, is that recognition. Um, and so it's only, you're going to struggle as a believer because of the paradoxical nature of your faith. Without humility and without critical thinking, the ability to think two or three things simultaneously. I mean, what does it mean to be in the world and not of it? It means to think two things simultaneously the exact same time, right? You're in a world that you're called to minister to, you're called to reach, you're called to evangelize and disciple. At the same time, you're not actually one with this exact world. There's always going to be until, you know, there's always going to be some measure of distance between you and them minus recognition of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So, um, I, I don't think we live, that's a long-winded way of saying, I don't think we live any differently at all. We live as if God is good in judgment, and we live as if God is good in jubilee, because in both, he is. You guys want to add to that? 
Yeah, I would say if you have adult children, and it's unclear, if you have adult children, I think you need to be inspired by the story of uh, St. Monica and St. Augustine and her unceasing prayer for him. You just need to pray, 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 pray. Do that for your young children, but when they're under your roof, and when they're very little, they're not just perfect little angels because they happen to be born to you and you're raising them. A lot of Christian families do not raise their children with the knowledge that they are sinners. That they are, and it doesn't need to be constant, like hovering. Mm-hmm. Your little no, but yet they, they need to be doing this in several ways. Now, you Adorable need to dis- ones, but yes. sinners nevertheless. You need, you need yeah. to discipline them for yes, for things that are may not things of great weight. But I taught my children those little things snowball into the big things. Uh, so and and uh, while well, you keep them safe, and you have to make choices all the time. Choose a Christian school, things like that. But again, that's not on autopilot. You also have to have give them challenges. Uh, in their lives where they answer the call of Christ that they are ready for as a, last year Ainsley you're going to take some slings and arrows for this I think this is something you need to consider doing on saved girl sports all right and lastly this has nothing to do with your children I don't know you but I think you need to take on what fear is in your own life independent of children or not be not afraid you're commanded to do that so it's it might not even be a child issue how much do you let fear in consume yeah. you dictate you at the very least fear god more than you let fear yes. any of those things amen. yeah amen to both of you and I, I would just say and it's different on a couple of different things ben is still 19 20 months year uh, 20 months old um but i think another thing is i i think i have a different approach maybe than previous generations because i have not seen at least for especially for my adult life and basically my entire life i've not seen the totality of the destruction of this culture as children of the 80s and um, and, and previous generations mm-hmm. have. And so I, it's never really occurred to me necessarily to worry uh, maybe as much as those previous generations because I haven't had I haven't had the curse of Excellent seeing the totality of, of the yep. destruction. And so I just think, yeah, I, I'm, I, I see the, the, the destruction around me, but it doesn't do Ben any good. It doesn't do Bella any good, my wife, and it doesn't do myself any good to worry just it's baked into the cake at this point Mm -hmm. and so you have to be nimble along the lines of what todd was saying nothing on autopilot but be nimble in your thinking and your willingness to adapt and change to the circumstances around you because it's changing and it always will especially especially in a culture that is so unstable a society that is so unstable you just have to bake that bake that into the cake and so it doesn't do really me any good it doesn't do anybody around me in my chair in, in my charge to to be worried or consumed so that's kind of what i would say that's a great point and it's a great perspective because this is a relatively new phenomenon this is the first generation of christians anywhere in the world that have had to deal with how do i raise my children in a society that my worldview inspired and now it's 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 turned on it and those those institutions that were created by my worldview are now weaponized against me no no other previous generation of christendom has ever dealt with this because christianity was marginalized in every every culture. I mean, it goes back to what we just celebrated yesterday. Christianity is before it's a religion, it's a historical fact, or it's not. Either Christ was raised or he wasn't. If he was raised, then you, then it becomes a religion. If he wasn't, then it wasn't right. And that's why it typically has not played well in, in diverse cultures, because that's a, that's an either or proposition. There's no nuance there. Either Jesus walked out of that tomb or he did not. And if he did pay attention, to everything him and his disciples say, if they didn't, then don't pay any attention to them at all. And there's nothing, if, if, if he did walk out of that tomb, then we know which worldview is true. If he didn't walk out of that tomb, then we don't know which worldview is true. You know what I'm saying? So the, that lack of nuance has always created friction for Christianity in every culture. It, and it's really only been in this country, even, even at the time the I mean, Remember why the pilgrims came here. They weren't fleeing the Moors. They were fleeing the Church of England. Guys, Protestants fleeing Protestants. And in much of, and many of the other European nations at the time, the Catholic king or queen was going to kill the Protestants, and the Protestant king or queen was going to kill the Catholics. This is a relatively new thing. And, and, and even in this country, it really wasn't until midway through the 20th century that if you were a believer in black... You didn't have to worry about these kinds of things, right? So this is a relatively new phenomenon of, wow, I mean, I'm a Christian. I get the benefit of the doubt. This society is based on my belief system and therefore defers to me on questions of ethics and morality. And this is new. It's new to us. 
it's actually not new to the Christian church. It survived for 2,000 years. It still got married, had families, all in the midst of persecutions and everything else. Next up, we go to Power Comics Incorporated, who has this. We're looking for real-life examples of the parables of Jesus experienced by you, Todd, and Aaron. Can you share some with us? We're creating a comic book series where the first half of each comic shows the original parable as told in the Bible, followed by a modern-day real-life example. God bless Austin uh, Ho, uh, Power Comics Incorporated. P.S. We'd also love to publish Nefarious as a graphic novel and and or an ongoing series. Please let us know if you're interested as well. Wow, that's quite an that's quite an endeavor. Email me, um, Steve at stevedace.com to discuss the the Nefarious graphic novel aspect. That would be uh, yeah, that's that would something. be that would be something for sure. We'll we'll talk about it. I could see my son wanting to be involved in something like that too. That's right up his alley. But uh, as to your other question. I mean, I, I, let's go to perhaps the most famous parable Jesus ever told, the parable of the prodigal son. I, I have actually now, at different times, been all three characters in that story. Um, I started off as a prodigal son. That Not until I was 30 years old did the Lord finally get a hold of me, and then I was welcomed back. Here's the purple gown, the fatted calf. Let's have a banquet. My son whom is lost is now found. Then, you know, I matured a little bit more and I, I had to be careful not to become the older son who gets bitter. Hey, what well, you know, I'm here. I've been doing I've been faithful. I've been loyal this entire time. Like I'm owed a little bit more and be reminded, hey, you are a sinner too. You were forgiven too, you know, and now I'm the father. Now, of course, this is the father here in the parable is all, the heavenly father, obviously. But in the role of father, you know, I waited, waited. I let Anna go through her phase of, you know, spiritual exploration. I've got two other children that have or will at some, peri- ser- some period of time do that. And so now I'm, you know, I've played the role in that parable of the father who has waited for, you know, children to uh, figure out that what he tried to impart to them when they were younger was not out of anything other than love for them and a warning of what they are capable when they get too far afield from their father's love. And I would also say there is a parable that Jesus tells about workers and that people that had been working for longer were upset that people who got hired more recently were given the same rate of pay. And, and Jesus' response is, I mean, the, the master gets to decide who gets paid and what and for how much. And um, were you not paid more? You were still paid more money. You were here longer than them, right? Mm-hmm. So you got paid the same rate, but did, you, but did that same rate accumulate more for you over time because you were here and more faithful longer? Yes. You know, and so again, I've been both sides of that equation. When I first got converted, I was the one that was given the same rate day one. And now I have to remind myself not to be self-righteous and hard-hearted because such as once was some of us. And remember that, yes, if other people are given the same rate as me, even though they're relatively new to the job, um, I was still getting the rewards of my faithfulness all that entire time. I was not shortchanged at all. And then I would say for me, um, I have tried to live the parable of the talents. I've taken that one extremely personal. I, I have done everything I, I could to take every relationship, every platform that God has given me, resources God has given me, and I go all in all the time. I go all in all the time. I don't worry about addition or subtraction. I think God works on multiplication tables only, you know? And so this movie is another example. Just we're going all in. Let's see what happens. May flop. I don't know. I have no idea what it will do. You know, we did the best we could do. We made the best movie we could make with the resources we had. We made a better movie than you can make with the resources we had, if we're being brutally honest in terms of the quality of the film. We made a better movie than we could have with our resources. But I don't know. I still don't know today. It's 12:15 Central. Uh, I don't I don't know right now and won't know for a few more hours. Am I in 600 theaters, 1,000, 1,100, 750, 800? I don't know, you know? And so the reason why that matters is there's only so many seats in those theaters, right? And so you look at a movie like uh, His Only Son that uh, VidAngel put out, they're in 2,000 theaters. The more theaters you're in, the more money you can earn because the more seats you can sell. 
you know? And so I have no idea. We may get completely sodomized on the theatrical release of this film. I, I don't know. I don't know. But if we if it happens, I'll be disappointed, but I won't regret that we did this at all because we made a hella movie. And that's what we were called to do. Make the best movie we could make that spoke to this period of time and then gamble on God, gamble on the sovereignty of God. And and throughout my career, from walking out of WHO, everything I've done has been the parable of the talents. I have taken that literally. Um, that I'm a kid born to a 15-year-old mom, take a drink, and therefore I am playing with house money. So I got nothing to lose. Let it ride. Amen. Well said. Next, we go to Christopher James Johnson. Question for all three of you again as a parent. Uh, let's see. That is the wrong one. My bad. Stephen Patrick Henry says, recently we visited a new church. Service was great. At the end of the service, there was an announcement that a woman was being considered for a deacon role at the church. In every church I've ever been a part of, this was a position held by a man. What are your thoughts on a woman in this position? So for those of you that are new to the church or unchurched and don't know what these terms mean, deacons basically serve the physical needs of the church. Elders serve the spiritual needs of the church. All right. There is absolutely zero zip zilch, not a biblical precedent for female elders at any point in time, period. There's actually more of a precedent for females preaching than there are for female elders. We had a female judge, for example, named Deborah. It's extremely rare. And even in the case of Deborah, is it Ehud? I can't remember. Is, it, is the I one who the is name. given the mission from God? Right. And, and he says he won't go unless Deborah goes with him. And she looks at him and says, okay, just know that you're going to be insulted throughout history, that you wouldn't do what God told you to do unless a woman went with you. Just calls him out as a complete wimp, basically. All right. Now, there is, this is, it gets a little murkier when you get into questions of deacons. And now I thank you, Todd, my inbox, which I just <laughs> got caught up and cleaned, and cleaned out, will uh, be cursing you here in the next uh, three hours for the emails I am about to receive in response to this. All right. There is some evidence, people like Tabitha, who was, uh, who I believe delivered correspondence on Paul's behalf. Correct. Um, could that be translated again, serving the physical? Did she write the letters? No. Did she, um, uh, did, 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 was, was she given the Holy Spirit to compose the letters and teach the people via her epistles? No, Paul was. But did she serve the physical needs of the church at the time by helping to deliver and disseminate said letters? Yes. Other women played the role of hospitality and things of that nature. That could be interpreted as a, as a physical serving the physical needs of the church. All right. So my opinion, I would not immediately say no. If you went to a church that you otherwise liked, but it was allowing women to help serve the physical needs of the church. But I would absolutely put them on, put them on watch. And I'll give you a, a story. Um, the young lady that uh, used to sit in your chair, Todd, Jen, she was a um, Bob Jones University graduate. Mm -hmm. And uh, her senior year at Bob Jones, which, you know, they, they, you want to talk about putting the fun in fundamentalism, that is Bob Jones University, brother, right? Her senior year, she had no, no man stepped up to be the senior class president. So she put in for it. And she got called into the, the dean's office. And he said to her, hey, you know, we're a, a Bible-based school. We believe in male headship. You know, what are you doing here? She goes, well, I, I believe in male headship too. I'm just wondering though, what do we do? No men stepped up in, the, in my class. You know, I mean, I'll gladly step aside if a man wants the position. I'll, I'll gladly step aside and respect male headship. But if, if no men are willing to step up, what do we do? Just not have a class president because no men stepped up what do we do you know and so we're we are in an era where men will not automatically step up so i don't know that congregation maybe they have tried to get men to be involved in serving the physical needs of the church and unable maybe they're trying to make a political statement could be either one of those right that's why i would be on the lookout i'd, I'd put them on watch you know, I, 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 I would not immediately walk out if I liked everything else. If nothing else gave me, bell, you know, made my spidey sense tingle, I wouldn't walk out. But I would absolutely be on the lookout for what's the motivation for doing this. And then if men won't step up and serve, why won't the men step up and serve? 
right? Mm -hmm. Are they not adequately being inspired or called out? You know, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I think that this would be for me an area of much discernment, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't be quick to immediately eject. Now, I mean, who knows, you know, part of that discernment may be next Sunday ago. And they're like, we've got a video from Beth Moore and she wants to teach us why women should be in the pulpit. You get up and walk out, you know, that that's not the place for you to be. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I would, I would, I would not immediately walk out, but I would be absolutely discerning more evidence in this case. Anybody want to disagree with that? No. Oh. A, I'm Catholic. B, we, I don't know, it's been like 20 years now where the church uh, started using uh, female altar servers. Mm -hmm. I have four daughters. None of them were altar servers. So that's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have an interesting one. This is from Leslie Reed McIntosh. He says, should we as Christians still circumcise our male children for those who actually know what the male gender is? Now that I'm <laughs> older and my boys are teens, if I had to do it over, I wouldn't. Would you, and if yes, as a Christian, why? Well, I would turn it around and ask the other way. Why wouldn't you? I, I don't know. I'm asking. I mean, I just... Why wouldn't you? See, for me, so you brought this up a, a couple weeks ago, Todd, that the local sports talk radio station running a commercial every single day yeah. about um, vasectomy. And in, actually, in the commercial, no more, uh, if they say, no more this, and that's the sound of a baby crying. It's just this rejection of, I guess, that's, that's the way I would read this, this rejection of the notion that the way we were made is fine. We're not Jewish. We're not the Israelites. We're not necessarily called to do this spiritually, I don't think. Now, there has been, I mean, no. there's, differing, no. there's differing opinions medically, whether or not, you know, um, sanitation wise, whether or not it's a good thing to do. But this is something that I just took for granted again before the last few years, this notion that the way we were created is wrong. I'll say, I, I forgive me. I've got <laughs> 666 <laughs> guns pointed at my head right now. And I just... I don't have the energy for this question, okay? I, I just, I, I don't have the hard drive space, and I long for the day that I can give you a very strong take on 21st century circumcision, all right? What I can tell you is that not just the symbolic nature of some of the ceremonial aspects of, of the Jewish law that God gave to Moses uh, and to the Levitical priests, there's a very functional aspect to it as well. Um, for example... Um, pigs would literally eat anything in front of them. And therefore, when you ingest said pig, you're ingesting anything that a pig would eat, correct? So it wasn't just that God said idly, uh, let me say, spin the wheel of destiny and let's tell the Jews which meats they can't eat. They were filthy animals. It was not healthy in many cases in the ancient world to eat a pig or its products. Shellfish, a lot of times are at the bottom of the ocean. Which means they got their mouth opens when every other fish is doing what? Dropping its deuce in the water, right? Not a clean fish. How many people have shellfish allergies and how many people have cod allergies, gentlemen? How many people are like, oh man, I've just got a, I got a terrible uh, um, trout allergy. You ever heard anybody have a trout allergy? I mean, now my inbox will be full of people who have a trout allergy, but you see what I'm saying? All kinds of people have shellfish allergies. So... I have no idea about this. Is there, is there another, is this one that would also tie into some of those ancient laws that also there was a medical reason to do this? I have no idea. If someone wants to argue with me that by removing your son's foreskin, you have limited their sexual pleasure. I, I think, man, I don't know. I don't know what I can speak of in total certainty on this program, but on this, I am confident. The men of this era are not lacking for sexual pleasure. Okay? On that one, I am a, I'm 10,000% certain that the men of this era are not lacking for sexual pleasure. And probably all other men of every other era of man is jealous of this era of men. The men of this era have so much sexual pleasure, it's get, becoming cool to just stop having sex. 
because it's old. It's boring. All right. So I, I just, if that's your case, I, I, I'd come up with a better reason. I can promise you in this era, the one thing no one is short of if, on the male side, if they're looking for it, is sexual pleasure. Aaron, I just want to say you nailed that answer. I'm in no way of a like mind with this as I am with vaccination. Do it. Don't do it. I, I, but it goes back to the beginning right away. When you have children, th- these questions are vaccination, circumcision, and you instantly, if you think about it, you're just, you're just programmed. Ask yourself why out of the gate. If we learned anything from COVID, the medical experts lead you uh, uh, let you down over and over and over again. Don't take for granted any decision like this. If you're asking a question like this, I think it's good. Next up, we go to Marilyn Reed, who says, had an interesting discussion about whether Mormons can really be believers. We're going to be pissing off everybody today. Some of my Christian friends Totally dismiss Glenn Beck because he's a Mormon. What's your position on this? I don't believe Joseph Smith was a prophet. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Next up, we go this to... Isn't, this isn't a Mormon question to me. We just talked about this last week. This is like RFK Jr. We talked about the same thing. I mean, my goodness, there's an organization called Gays Against Groomers. Like in the battle that you rightly just talked about, 600 guns pointed at our head, you know, like... Glenn Beck is a giant of the movement and has been for a very long time. Like you, the fact that he's Mormon, I can't, I just, I I love the language of this. Like, like the thought of discounting the work of Glenn Beck, everything he's done simply because he's Mormon is insane, which means it's not really a Mormon question to me. It's about like how, how do we evaluate truth? What is our plumb line? By their fruit, you will know them. That's how we evaluate it. Exactly. I don't believe Joseph Smith is a prophet. If I did, I'd belong to an LDS church. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, will be saved, and you know a tree by its fruit. That's my answer to this question, whether you want to ask me about any sect, any any wayward sect, any other religion, any individual, a family member. How do I even look at the people in my own church who, how do I know if they're actually saved or just going along to be a a part of a church experience? It's the same. I would, I I would, I would answer, you know, the first one might be different depending on the context of what belief system they claim to be a part of. But ultimately it comes down to whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, um, you know, a tree by its fruit is the fruit of salvation in their lives. If it is, they're saved. If it's not, they're not. It's pretty simple, yeah. actually. Amen. More in a moment. Going about your daily life, dealing with chronic and constant pain is a bang. What if I offered you the opportunity to see if you don't see a difference in three weeks or less where that is concerned? Yeah, that's where our friends over at Relief Factor come in. Give Relief Factor a shot. See what it can do for you. It is not a drug, but it was developed by doctors who can prescribe drugs to fight inflammation. Instead, they produced this product instead. And if you can try it today, get the three-week quick start for just $19.95 and find out for yourself if you're going to be one of the about 70% of people who try the quick start and see such tremendous results that they become full-time customers and come back and order more. Just go to relieffactor.com. That's relieffactor.com. Try the three-week quick start there. 20 bucks. What do you got to lose? Your pain, if you're struggling with it, can't get any worse. Give it a shot for just 20 bucks for three weeks. Relieffactor.com or call them at 800, the number four, relief. 800, the number four, relief to get the three-week quick start. 800, the number four, relief or relieffactor.com. On the circumcision topic, I did just receive this note from Lacey who has a take none of us have because or would even think to have because none of us are named Lindsey Graham. Lacey writes, circumcised ones look better from a female's perspective. I'll tell you, I am married to a therapist who deals with sexuality and sexual dysfunction. We have had virtually every conversation about sexuality in our marriage you could possibly contemplate because of what she does for a living. The one thing we have not discussed, because my name's not Lindsey Graham either, is which of these things are more visually appealing to females. 
because I don't particularly find anything about penises to be visually appealing. Todd, your thoughts? No. Can, can we <laughs> dispatch Lindsey Graham to get to the bottom of that one? Yes. Yes. I mean, he would be the subject matter expert here. Let us continue. We go now to Barbara Ketchum. Is there any way to fight the digital dollar battle? What do you think citizens should do who do not want it? Isn't it interesting, Steve, uh, just if I could add this as well, isn't it interesting? We just went through a global pandemic where all the world governments, the major ones, had the exact same response. In response, the West in particular imposed a proto version of the Mark of the Beast. And just so, just so happens that in the aftermath of this great global event, this pandemic, that we're now talking about ditching physical dollars to go to hmm. CBDCs. Isn't Random coincidental events, I'm sure. I, I, there's a couple of things you could do. Um, number one, well, first of all, recognize that there are limitations to what you can do. Okay, I mean, there are certain things that governments can do that individuals cannot. Coin money, raise an army and declare war, right? And, and it's not a coincidence that those are the two areas where throughout history... Governments have tended to be the most abusive because they can do those things or impose those things that we can't do or impose on one another. So recognize that sometimes you're just living in the wrong era of history. Again, this is all new to us because we were born into a country where this was almost considered like a birthright. OK, that's not the case anymore. None of this would be new at all. I mean, one of the things that Christ is challenged with is the face of Caesar is on a Roman coin, and yet they're to pay taxes. Is this an act of worship if Caesar is declaring himself to be God, right? Mm -hmm. This is, navigating this is what Christians had to do for thousands of years. It's just Christians in the West have not had to do this until now, but we'll be doing it in the years to come without revival. This is where we are headed. So there's, there's limits and that's why we have wars and civil wars and revolutions, because governments decide they're going to go to a place that they no longer will be, um, they will no longer listen to dissent. And so uh, throughout history, including with the founding of this country, people have, have decided, well, we've, we're going to have to you know, push some dissent upon you, push it on you, because you're not going to tune in. So there are limits here, peaceable. But in terms of those limits, I don't believe we've reached them yet. Um, is your state willing to join the consortium on the digital currency that Ron DeSantis is putting together with governors around the country? For, just as an example. I mean, that's, that's one place. Um, we just told you about Birch Gold in the last hour. Do you have your money or any of your wealth tied up in any actual hard asset? Okay. Those are things that, um, you, that, those are things that we can peaceably do. We can vote for candidates who uh, stand with us on this. We can urge all of our red states to join the the Santis coalition in saying we're not going to install this in our states. And I know that this won't be convenient to some of you, but the spirit of the age wants California to become a place where it is painful for you to live there. And it is going in and, and, and New York and Illinois and Oregon and Washington state. And it's going to keep pushing those limits and boundaries to that end, you know? So move to a place where they won't impose this. Will my red state join with the consortium against it? Um, will I vote for candidates federally who will be opposed to it? Will I, um, have some of my own wealth tied up into hard assets so that I am as, exposed and liable to it and, and, and as possible. Those are some things you can't do, but some t or you can do. But sometimes in history, guys, the enemy wins sometimes. Me, uh, go read the headlines. You'll get headlines of enemy wins every day. Sometimes the enemy wins. Sometimes you don't get to you don't you don't get to live in a free moment in human history. Those have actually been quite rare, which is why we should do everything we possibly can to not let them take it from us here. Next up, we go to Paul Monahan. What went wrong with the overturning of Roe? This should be a seminal moment for us, but it feels like it's been a net negative. Does the left have better messaging? What lessons can the right learn from the aftermath? I guess I would want to know why you think it's a net negative. Um, I don't. I don't necessarily buy that it has been the reason for what happened in Wisconsin. I went through those numbers. 
there was a point and a half difference in in, in the same guy running on the, for the Republicans in the Wisconsin race. Was it one and a half or two and a half? I can't remember, but it was it. I mean, yeah, he lost in 2020. There was no overturning of Roe. He he ran with Trump's endorsement, lost by 11 points. All right, runs again in 2023 and post um, Roe v. Wade overturning and decides to run without Trump's endorsement. And would he lose by 12 or 11 and a half something? So negligible. When you actually pour through the data, um, th- uh, there was there was a, 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 a strong turnout of unmarried women for Democrats, but unmarried women have always been a Democratic constituency. That's never changed. That's always been the case, and it likely always will be. I mean, so as a Republican, you have to go in. It, you can't say we lost the last election because too many unmarried women showed up. That's on that. Then, then if, if that's in that environment that we just had, if that's what happened to you, then you did a pretty piss poor job getting the married women to show up to you for you in in the in the in the in the volume and the amount that you asked for them. So. I, I think there's a couple of things at play. Number one, too much of the country is balkanized now and will not even consider voting for somebody different because the values are so opposite. And and and, and there are too many people. Gretchen Whitmer could plant them as garden seeds in their yard and they still wouldn't vote for a Republican just because the values are too at odds with one another. And that works the other way too. You know, I think that's part of it. And then I think... I think a lot of people, a lot of voters have just collectively lost faith in the Republican Party. I just think that they don't know what it is. Is it the Trump Party? Well, I don't like him. Uh, Is it the Mitch McConnell Party? Well, I I hated that guy before I knew what a Donald Trump was, you know? So uh, I, I, you know, I was on a show over the weekend with a buddy of mine and I love him to death, man. And he's trying to get me all pepped up. And I'm like, listen, brother. We, in the last three election cycles since 2016, Republicans are minus 22 in congressmen, minus eight in governors, and minus three in senators. This ain't trending well at all, you know? So this thing is in dire need of a massive rebrand or reboot. Or it just may be that the brand in, it is just irrevocably broken. I don't know. Couldn't happen to a more deserving party. No, it couldn't. The they, they asked for it, for sure. Yes. Next, we go to Paul Tauk. Before the election, you predicted a red wave, then a red tsunami, then a red wedding. That analysis was flat wrong. Did that shake your confidence in your analytical abilities? If not, why not? If so, what will you do in the future to attempt more accurate political analysis? You bet I did, which is why, how much political analysis have you heard out of me since last November? How much of that have we done? It's minimal at best. Yeah. And I can promise you that trend will continue. Minimal at best. I'm, yeah, is your answer. That's why we don't almost do any of it. I'm not breaking down polls on the, the, the election or the primary favorabilities. We've barely talked about that stuff. So that has a catchy ring to it. I know you show like motto. it. Minimal at best. <laughs> I mean, in, in in 2020, the polls were every bit as wrong as I was telling you going to the election that they were. They were off by an average of nearly five points. All right. And that's, to me, one of the strongest evidences for the stealing of the election. In this last election cycle, they were actually pretty accurate. The mainstream um, media polling had a pretty strong comeback in this last election. So I have no idea whether it will be trustworthy in 2024 or not. I don't have a clue. I don't. When we get to that election cycle, I will probably look at their methodology to see if it adds up. But, I mean, if they can just, you know, ballot harvest and steal elections, you can make hell of things add up that you never could add up before because you're doing new math. You're determining the math yourself. Math, math in and of itself isn't a constant anymore. It's just a variable and it just comes down to which very, how many variables you need to win. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So all of America becomes Maricopa County in that circumstance. I was interested in how you're going to answer this, but I think this, the the questioner, Steve has been, you could ask this question now because Steve has a history of being more right than wrong more often than not. And and it's because of those constants he's talked about. He has not wish cast. He's relied on objective data and not let that get in the way of anything he's thought or felt about anything as best as he could. That's what's made his different. Sooner or later, statistically, uh, it, just like with betting, I mean, you guys come in all the time and talk about mm-hmm. like the bad, the bad beat and things like that. This was a, 
this was a bad beat. So you adjust a very bad beat. and you learn and you go on. Yeah. Now, I mean, so so my position that I don't think Donald Trump can win a general. Now, don't get me wrong. Y'all go on a suicide mission next year and decide to nominate him anyway. I will be one of his. I'll, I'll be. They'll do five thousand mules on the other side. You'll see me on camera stuffing ballot boxes in Des Moines. All right, because that's what it will take. And it won't. And I won't rely on any polls. I'm not. I'm not even looking at polls. I'm just looking at the only poll that matters in the last three elections since Donald Trump won in 2016 by fewer than. 80,000 votes total in four states. Republicans are minus eight in governors, minus three in senators, minus 22 in congressmen. That's not a good trend line, period, end of sentence. That's why I don't think he can win. Before we move on um, and get a few more in, something incredible is about to happen in the Nashville area. Our friend Jason Whitlock has been inspired to organize the Fearless Army Roll Call. It's an all-day event in Nashville that will encourage men to put on the full army, full armor of God, to take a stand against the spirit of the age that is threatening and destroying American culture. And at this conference, you're going to hear speeches from Jason and several special guests that will inspire and convict you, but you're running out of time. So join hundreds of like-minded men in Nashville. On April 15th, that's this weekend, for this important conference, tickets are selling out fast. Secure yours today by going to fearlessarmyrollcall.com and reserve your spot. Fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Again, that's fearlessarmyrollcall.com. All right, this is the last one uh, that we have from our, uh, from our audience today. This is from Emily Davis, who says, Is the freedom of religion too free? Was it meant only for believers in Jesus Christ, the creator and Lord over all? Israel was told plainly by God to clear their land so they wouldn't be misled by idols. Looks like we've made the same mistakes. A Hindu wants to be our commander in chief. And I haven't heard any interviewer ask him what the Hindu worldview is. So I I think it's absolutely clear that... When the, when the founders spoke, if you just look at their own writings at the time, you look at their behavior. Remember, they came from 13 colonies, 12 of which were fashioned, formed, founded by some vestige of the Christian church. The one exception was Rhode Island. And it was founded to be a safe haven for all denominations of Christianity to feel free there. But if you look at when they talk about no religious test for office in the Constitution, that was that didn't mean that you could not vet a candidate's religious beliefs. What it meant was since all these they were trying to form a federal union of all these colonies that were, again, formed and fashioned by different vestiges of the Christian church. And I, I think I told you guys a little while ago here on the show, uh, Christendom has not always lived at peace with its, within and of itself with one another. And so. That was, if you, if you, if you were not a congregationalist in Connecticut, if you were a Baptist, you couldn't serve and you couldn't hold public office. That's what the Dan Barry, when the, the first time the phrase of free of, of uh, separation of church and state is ever referenced in the American lexicon is when a group of Dan Barry Baptists write a letter to then President Jefferson saying, hey, we aren't being allowed full repres- full agency here as Baptists in this congregationalist state. So we want the federal government to intervene. You guys said no religious test for office here. Then Jefferson says, hey, while I find that the practice of the Congregational Church in Connecticut to be abhorrent, you want to talk about abhorrence. Ask the federal government to start refereeing your religious disputes and we'll be dark and terrible as the dawn. Don't do it. Take it from the guy who wrote the declaration. This is not what I meant. Figure it out where you are. There is a thin line he wrote. Of separate a wall, a thin line, a thin wall of separation between church and state for the protection of the church from the state, not the state from the church. So it's 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 very obvious that they could not, they were not conceiving of a world where people outside the the Judeo Christian worldview, because they conceived a republic on God given rights. So someone who believes in a different God or no God at all, how do they secure our God-given rights? It's pretty obvious. And the way that you stopped the people who believed in God, the only living God, is one of the things he says is to love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? So Mm -hmm. you don't want your neighbor imposing on you unjustly, so don't impose on him. Mm -hmm. And that was the delicate balance. Well, we've, we've completely lost that 
in this day and age. And so trying to fight this fight is a little bit like, um, I don't want school vouchers. I, I, I just want to go to 1794. Well, I, I'd love to have the education system of 1794. Is that attainable? No. No. So right now, this is what we can do. I live in the now. I live in the world that is, not the world that I want it to be, the world as it actually is. This is the best we can do right now. We can allow you to take your funding and defund these demonic structures and take your funding and go where you want to go instead. So the, 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 this is, you know, this is broken free of the seal. This is just not an achievable goal in our current society as it's constructed. That's why no one ever talks about it. But thank you for ending on this question so everyone will hate me now. <laughs> John 317.